So one down and four to go. There were moments, there were moments that Indian fans would have uh, held their hearts in their mouth, bit their nails and chewed them off at Rajkot. In the end, it's nil-nil. All square as we head to the second test in Visakhapatnam. Good evening, this is ESPN Cricket for Match Day. And delighted, as always, to be joined by Nick Compton in the studio here in Bombay. Good evening. Saurav Ganguly in Kolkata. We're going to get the thoughts of both uh, Nick and Saurav as we uh, recap everything that's happened in this first test. And it has set this series up uh, beautifully. Saurav and Nick have said that through the course of uh, ESPN Cricket for Match Day. And a quick reminder, in case you missed the action from day one, given what's going on in the world and in India uh, when this test match started. But uh, in the end, 172 for six is what India managed after being set a target of 310. Uh, once Alistair Cook had completed his 30th test match, 100 and broken a few records for overseas batsmen at home, 260 for three is where England declared, gave India about 50 overs and they managed to get six wickets in that. Right, so there is so much that we need to talk about now and uh, it sets up our talking points on this uh, recap show for uh, the first test at Rajkot. These are our match day match points and we will of course talk about Alistair Cook because uh, he just seems to love coming to India. That's a bit later on the show. We also speak of whether this big Ashwin threat that overseas teams have tried to fix, whether that's been nullified. Uh, we look forward to Visakhapatnam. Before that, the declaration, because that had a few people tweeting in, maybe in hindsight. But the first question that I will put to uh, Nick Compton and Saurav Ganguly, and uh, we will uh, talk about whether it is the advantage to England. Your, th your uh, thoughts and comments must come quickly. So we uh, take a look at uh, what Twitter had to say and tweet to us uh, when it came to uh, whether it was advantage to England. And I think what we'll get is that it was a psychological advantage uh, to Team uh, England. Sort of, uh, that's what we were getting on uh, Twitter. Is that a fair comment? Psychological advantage to England at the end of the first test? Yeah, you can say that, but just for this test match, because you know it's going to be a new test in Vizac and, uh, and it's going to be a new game of cricket. Toss again will be very, very crucial on the surface, more than what has happened in Rajkot. But to be honest, if you look at the five test matches England has played in the last, uh, since the last trip, four last time in Ahmedabad, in, uh, in Bombay, in, in Calcutta and in, and in Nagpur and now in Rajkot, England have had four better test matches than India. So it's not just about this test match. This England team has played well in India over a period of four test matches out of the five test matches. So I think that's a very, very, um, uh, I would say, a confidence boosting uh, performance by, in by England especially in India where teams get rolled over very, very quickly. You saw how New Zealand got rolled over, how Australia got rolled over a couple of years ago. It's this England side who's probably, the, probably played the best in these conditions. So I think, yes, they will go confident in, this, uh, in the next test, but Alistair Cook knows that come Vizag, if he, if he loses the toss, if India bats first, it'll be pressure on England in, in, the, in the fourth innings. Okay, well, just coming back to your uh, tweets now, and we just uh, uh, talk about what the mood was. I know a lot of English fans were tweeting it. Indian fans were uh, taken a bit by surprise, given the recent success uh, that we have had uh, when we're looking at India tests at home. Yash says, well, from India, psychological advantage given to England with all these wickets, referring to that final session when India lost six wickets. Maybe that's uh, a question to put in just a minute to uh, Nick and Saurav, whether if India would have just played out two or three down, whether that would have made a difference. An Ankesh Pillai says, never imagined us fighting to save a test match. D dare I say, these might be some younger viewers sort of saying that they've not uh, uh, imagined this Indian team fighting to save a test match. And uh, Rajiv Singh, England outplayed India. We'll go into the second test with a psychological advantage. Virat did well as a batsman, need to improve. As uh, captain, Nick Compton, at the back of how that Bangladesh series went with the way things have started, how much of an impact does that have on England going forward? Well, I think it's kept them very hum humble, very level coming into the series. And I think they've uh, probably surprised themselves or, and made themselves a very pleased camp going into the second test match. You know, but on the flip side, I also think that perhaps this is the wake-up that India need. You know, perhaps, you know, they've won some easy test matches over the, the last few months. We have definitely more to see from, from Mr. Ashwin and, and from Jadeja. So we haven't seen the best of them yet. And it is one test match. You know, England had the best of the conditions. You still have to score the runs. You still have to put the runs on the board. Uh, and they did that. But I, you know, as Mr. Ganguly says, you know, things can change in the second test match. You know, the toss is, a, is of, of big importance. But uh, I think advantage England, I think it's just a good stepping stone for England, particularly coming into the series. Is it a matter of concern, sort of, that second tweet which said uh, if India wouldn't have had that little collapse in the last session, maybe the psychological advantage wouldn't have gone to England. Has that made any difference? England watching India collapse in a session? 
No, I don't think so because uh, you know all the cricketers in that two dressing room know that Vizag will be a new day, and if India win the toss, uh, England will be facing a lot of heat on that surface because that surface is going to turn a bit more than what Rajkot has done. But but saying that, I think this pitch had a lot of assistance for the spinners. So I think I think uh, Alistair Cook and his boys are are matured enough, experienced enough to know how Test cricket changes. Imagine England in 2012; they lost in Ahmedabad. And came back and won the series, Bombay and Calcutta, and series was over for India. So uh, I, I don't believe in momentum in sport. Uh, this is a very good England side. This is a very good England Test side, a very good England One Day side. And I think English cricket has has really really gone forward with with the selection of players and the quality of players they have in their ranks. So as I said, it's going to be a Test series, good Test series, uh, but there's no guarantee of who wins the Test match one after the other. All right. Well, uh, this uh, sets things up nicely, and we are going to talk about that uh, second test match. Let's move to uh, match point number two here on ESPN Cricket for match day. Yes, it's a good start for England, but could it have been any better? And uh, I'm not raising this question. You guys are, because I was looking at the tweets, and there were some that were saying maybe Alistair Cook uh, should have uh, been a bit more bold. As we take the tweets now, uh, Cricket Wala Ayaz Memin, of course, a respected cricket journalist, says Cook must be asking himself if he shouldn't have perhaps declared. Half an hour earlier, asked his Twitter followers what uh, they think. Amuna sort of nicked that in a second, but uh, there were both sides to it. Akash Sharma saying uh, cautious with the declaration, not brave, well played England, but I wish you would have been bolder. Maybe Nick Compton's got uh, something to say to that on whether this is bold enough. Slightly staggered, says James Gray, to see people criticizing Cook's declaration. That's the other side. Watch the whole Test match and think again. All right, Nick Compton, you first. Was Cook right with the way he handled the declaration? Very easy to see here in hindsight. I, I, what he did, I expected. You know, I, I thought that they were going to try and make the game safe, make sure that only two outcomes were possible: an England win or a draw. In the end, it was a draw. Um, you know, and I, look, I think England did the. You know, in hindsight, first game, you know, probably did the right thing. Um, you know, put India under pressure at the end. But you know, perhaps if it was the third, fourth, even the fifth test, you know, you would have seen a different declaration. But it's hard to criticise. You know, I think um, I think you move on. You know, you take the positives. You know, England have done very well. They've put India under pressure. Um, but yes, in hindsight, no doubt, another 20 minutes, another 20 overs um, would have been very useful. Sort of at lunch, 261 ahead uh, were uh, England. They batted another nine and a half overs. What would you have done at that lunch break? Would you have uh, played on a bit? Yeah, I would have. England couldn't have declared at lunch with just 261 runs lead on the board. No, no, it, you, you don't want to stutter in your own camp. And also what it does is if you have those extra runs, uh, you can have a lot more fielders in the closing areas. England always had four catching fielders. You know, that's why Ashwin chipped it at short extra cover because England had runs on the board and never needed to worry about runs uh, in, uh, while defending this target. So I think it's the right decision. As Dick very rightly said, hindsight is a lot wiser. Uh, but Alistair Cook doesn't get hindsight. He's got to take a decision on the spot, and I think he's been spot on. Okay, well, let's uh, put that. We've passed judgment now on Alistair Cook, the captain, and we're going to give, uh, give us uh, plenty of time to talk about Alistair Cook, the batsman. He's as good as touring batsmen get when they come to India, and he has set things up for himself and for England for the rest of this series. We'll talk about that on the other side of the show. It's time to talk about Alistair Cook now because it was uh, his innings that uh, gave England the advantage going into that final session. How much of an impact does that have on the rest of the series? We're going to ask uh, Nick and Sora before that. Uh, let's see what you have to say about uh, Alistair Cook as we talk about our third uh, match point here on uh, ESPN Cricket for Match Day. And yeah, he's broken some numbers. We're going to come to that in uh, just a second. But uh, Sayan Basu says Alistair Cook just 31 and already scored 11,000 test runs. Damn, son, he is destined to surpass Tendulkar's test records. Okay, let's just hold on a bit. But uh, he certainly has numbers that uh, resemble Tendulkar's after 136 tests. Rob Moody, Alistair Cook, the best opening batsman I've ever seen. As I'd said before, just confirming my stance, all-round masterful batsman. And uh, from Devashish Palkar, every time Alistair Cook comes out to bat in India, it's as if he is taking revenge for Lagan. Keeps cooking runs and <laughs> tons. All right, let's move on from the puns. Nick Compton, uh, <laughs> there's this criticism in the cricket circuit. Cook has just two shots. He can get a lot of runs in India with those two shots, it seems. You'd be happy with one shot if you got that many runs, wouldn't you? No, he's very accomplished, isn't he? He knows his game. He's got a, a calmness and a, a, a small repertoire of shots. But when he plays those shots, when he chooses to play them, um, 
he rarely makes a mistake. And I think that's the, the key. You know, people talk about having talent, having ability, and that's fine. But uh, you've got to know when to use it. You've got to know how to use it. And that's something that Cook has not only done in India so well, but he's done it, you know, through a long period of time uh, in all conditions. Um, and he knows himself very well. He looks very settled. Um, he's unflappable. And I think those are the qualities of, of, of a very good opening batsman because, you know, it's a, it's a very tough place to bat. Okay, now we're going to make Alistair Cook the subject of our insights where we tell a story through the numbers. And I'm going to uh, bring this up and uh, put the question to Saurav Ganguly. The impact of getting runs in the first test of a series. And as we look at Alistair Cook's numbers, they are uh, better than uh, most batsmen. We're looking at uh, most runs by away batsmen in the first test of a series in India, Saurav. And Alistair Cook tops the runs list, an average of 84 and uh, 300s, the likes of Hashi Mamla, Andy Flower, Gordon Greenwich, and Clive Lloyd behind him. But just how does that set things up? Coming in as captain and getting the runs in the first test of a series, the impact that could have on the team? I think he's a terrific player, Alistair Cook, as a, and, and he's just 32, uh, as we've said before. 30 test hundreds, uh, one ahead of Sir Donald Bradburn today, and five test hundreds in India, more than anyone. And it just speaks volumes of his ability. Uh, there's no doubt more than 10,000 runs, highest number of runs for England, highest number of hundreds for England. And you know, he's an absolute champion for England. And, and he's still got four test matches to go and probably four or five years to go in, in international cricket. And I'm not surprised with what he's done. He's, he works hard for his runs. You could see that he's, he's someone who values test match performance. He's someone who values every run in test cricket. And, and, and it's terrific to watch, you know, he's in the last time in India, England came here, three, three hundreds and he started the series again with a hundred and he's got four test matches to go. Yeah, we've got some more numbers on uh, Alistair Cook and uh, he, he's enjoyed breaking some records. He's now also uh, in an illustrious list of uh, batsmen with the most hundreds when they've uh, uh, visited India in uh, test match cricket. You can see uh, the company he keeps, Hashi Mamla with 400s, Clive Lloyd, four, Everton Weeks, four. Maybe Nick and Sora, um, just, just discussing the other names we've taken. Amla, Lloyd, the likes of Andy Flower, and uh, of course, Gordon Greenwich, stroke players. Comparing Alistair Cook to that, it's a very different kind of game. So he's got something in his mind, or that's that strength mentally, Nick? Yeah, I mean, I can't talk about Clive Lloyd or Everton Weeks too much. I, I don't remember much uh, about them as players, but Hashim Amla, I definitely know well. Um, you know, I grew up batting with him, and, and something that comes to mind is, is his wrists and you often associate good spin players of spin with good wrists you know the Indian players have good wrists um, Hashi Mamla you know has an Asian background but again very wristy you know Alistair Cook when you think about him you, you know you probably wouldn't have thought necessarily you know he's going to be a fantastic player in the subcontinent you know he's not a particularly wristy player um, but I think that is credit to his mental strength as much as anything, that he's, he's managed to forge a technique and, and a way of scoring in, in, in India. I mean, his technique is, is very simple and he sweeps really well. And he, you know, as much as he doesn't have all the shots, he still scores um, quick enough. Do you remember anyone else, sort of, in all the years that you've played against op opposing batsmen, to have this almost in, in a respectful way, I say, limited sort of stroke play that Alistair Cook does, but still have so much success? I think Alistair Cook's greatest strength is his defence. You know, in turning pitches where the ball is turning, uh, I think his defence is impeccable. He goes back, he goes forth, and, and he's an exceptional player. Uh, his record is better than Lloyd. His record is better than Gordon Greenwich. Uh, no, his record at the moment is better than Hashi Mamla. So I don't think you can tell him that uh, not as talented or not as gifted as the rest. You know, sometimes you don't need to look good to score runs in test cricket. It's about effectiveness, and I think Alistair Cook has got so much quality, otherwise you don't get 30, uh, 30 test hundreds. You know, Andy Flower was dogged. I think Andy Flower was a similar player to Alistair Cook, who swept a lot. He played the reverse sweep, he played the normal sweep, he went back and forth against spinners in India. Uh, I think uh, both these players are similar sort of players, Andy Flower and Alistair Cook. They're gritty players, uh, they just fight it out. Matthew Hayden was a bit different. I thought Matthew Hayden has exceptional abilities in all formats of the game. But Alistair Cook is right up there and, and you don't need to look good to score runs in Test cricket and Alistair Cook has still got a few years to go. Yeah, sums it up for uh, Alistair Cook. Now, one of the things that he and the other England batsmen 
did uh, to near perfection is uh, R Ashwin and how they've nullified his threat, which leads us straight into our next uh, match point. Have uh, England defused the Ashwin bomb? And uh, let's see what you guys have been saying because the expectation level from R Ashwin has just uh, gone through the roof after the way he's bowled against uh, recent uh, visiting opposition. Pradeep says, even if India draws the game, this is of course a little earlier during the game, morally India's lost it and that's because it's been ages since uh, he saw an Indian team struggling at home. Hashtag Ashwin. So the inference that Ashwin has struggled in this test match. Uh, Siddharth Bora would have lost this test match if Ashwin as batsman had failed. Also would have won the test match if Ashwin as bowler has succeeded. I'm going to throw that to the panel in just a moment. Freddie Wilde says, uh, paradox, if Kohli is so worried about batting today to ask Ashwin to bowl negatively, then Ashwin shouldn't need to bowl negatively. This has all gone pretty hard on our Ashwin uh, after one test match, sort of. First question, simply put, has he not bowled well enough in this test? He's human at the day, isn't it? He just cannot turn <laughs> up and pick five wickets all the time. He's played an important role with the bat. And I don't think these questions should even be raised about Ravi Chandran Ashwin. You know, uh, at the end of the test series, five test series, he'll finish with probably the highest wickets with more number of wickets than anybody in this, in both the sides' bowling lineup. So. I'm a little surprised, but that's the way uh, that's the way you know public memory is. It's a bit short, and you just need to move on. After all these years, sort of, you're still surprised that uh, Indian fans <laughs> tend to jump to Twitter and get a bit impatient with our uh, with our players a little early. Before that, uh, Nick. Uh, just to look at where uh, our Ashwin bowled and one of those tweets spoke of whether he bowled negatively. We're talking about earlier on the fifth day when he bowled a right arm over line to Alistair Cook on a pitch which turned. Now, is this a result of the match situation, Nick? Is this a result of the way England have forced him? What did you make of that morning session? Yeah, I think there's two ways of looking at it. One, you know, fifth day uh, pitch and you've got our Ashwin, arguably the best spinner in the world, bowling over the wicket um, and into the rough in a, in a fairly defensive manner. But I think on the, on the back side of that, um, obviously England were now in, in the offensive, had a, a decent score on the, on the board. So any time that Virat Kohli could take out of, uh, out of England, you know, slow down the run scoring would mean that they would have less time to bat. Um, so you can understand from both accounts. Um, but I think, you know, quite a nice position for England to be in, you know. Ashwin on the first test match, fifth day, is bowling over the wicket. Obviously doesn't feel he can contain uh, the England captain from around the wicket who obviously, you know, clearly had the upper hand. So, um, it does pose a few questions, but um, he was, uh, it, there's still a lot of match cricket to go, as uh, Mr. Ganguly said. Yes, Soro. No, I don't think it was a negative tactics, and I was watching it, and, and I've heard that uh, phrase a few times, and he was trying to get Alistair Cook with a sweep. If you look at the, if you look at the field he had, he had a short final leg and a, and a and a deep square leg. He, knew, he knows Alistair Cook's going to, turn, going to sweep on turning pitches and he was just trying to use the rough outside the leg stump. It's just a different tactics of picking wickets. You know, he bowled, he bowled at him uh, initially over the wicket and with, with, with an attacking line, but when it did, didn't work, you know, he just went around the stumps and, and bowled at his pads and I really don't see any problem in that. You know, it's a way you, of picking wickets. Remember Ashley Giles bowled against Indian batsmen in the trip in 2006, I think, when or 2004, when England came here. He just kept bowling the entire three test matches into the pads of the Indian batsmen. So it's just a way of playing the game, and I really don't think uh, Ashwin was, was having any negative mindset in his, in his mind. He was just trying to find a different way of getting Alistair Cook out. You've got to give due credit to uh, Alistair Cook as well, who played uh, exceptionally on the fifth day. So you've heard a differing viewpoint, make your own uh, conclusions. But if we are to look at just the numbers from this Rajkot test, what you will see is that the England spinners have uh, plenty to take from it. This was always considered to be the Indian spinners that were good enough and England don't have the likes of Swan or Monty Panesar that they did when Nick Compton toured. But if you look at the battle of the overseas spinners, they have outdone India in this match. Better uh, uh, wickets on average and uh, in uh, Mumbai was the last time it happened, that famous test that Nick played in. And uh, before that it happened against New Zealand in Ahmedabad. Uh, so that's, that's just interesting food for thought. Uh, last uh, question just sort of to you. Ashwin's had a tough test. What's the challenge you expect? Uh, do you expect him to improve in any way in the second way? What's, what's his sort of approach to the next test after the way England have played him in this one? I think just uh, have a good rest for the next three days, sleep well, get the fitness going, do some stretching, do some pool session, uh, go to Vizac the day before the test, do some practice in the nets, get the line right and, and, and get back to normal. Somebody who has picked 230 test wickets in about 40 odd test matches, 
should not worry about a couple of four innings as a test match bowler. Right. And I think he's matured well, enough to do that. Anil Kumble and Virat Kohli will exactly tell him the same, that don't worry about it. Yeah. Find your rhythm in the next game and get through this England batting lineup in the next four test matches. I think he's still India's match winner in this series. India will depend on him to win this series for them and 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 I won't be surprised if yes, he does that by by Chennai just hold, hold and that the thought then just Saurav, yes we've got to take a very quick uh, break and of course look forward to uh, Vishakhapatnam what will Ashwin do what will the rest of the team do we'll have that chat with Nick and Saurav on the other side Okay, it's time to move forward now and uh, before we talk about that uh, second test match which takes place in uh, a few days in Visakhapatnam, it's time to play my favourite part of the show and that's Crick IQ with Saurav Ganguly and Nick Compton. Now they're both tied at 1-1. This is the question of the day, gentlemen, and we take the Alistair Cook theme. Name the only other overseas captain besides Alistair Cook to have scored 400s in tests in India and Saurav, you'll be happy to know we've got options today. Is it Andy Flower, Clive Lloyd? or Hashi Mamla. Do you want to go first, Saurav? I think it's Clive Lloyd. Uh, that would be my answer. And I'm even more happy now to answer this question because my, just, my side has just scored a goal against Delhi tonight. So uh, you can ask me a few more questions. <laughs> In good spirits, Nick Compton, your answer? I'm going to go for Andy Flower. Just to be different or you've got an idea? Because I watch less of Clive Lord, I don't, I don't know too much about him and uh, Andy Flower I know was a very adept player of spin in well, India so. Well Saurav you should have gone with him because when his time is right everything goes right. Saurav you're right and therefore you will take <laughs> a 2-1 lead uh, going into the second test to Nick Compton. It is indeed Clive Lloyd who scored 400s in 14 tests against India. Okay we have to quickly move uh, to uh, Visakha Patnam now and discuss uh, that test that begins of course on Thursday and Nick very quickly from a visiting side, are we expecting anything to change? Maybe when they go and see the pitch, perhaps? Not a huge amount. I mean, there's obviously Jimmy Anderson, who's uh, getting himself back to fitness. And, you know, any captain, any team would want uh, their stalwart, their, their leader of the bowling attack to come back in. My question would be, has he played enough cricket? Is he 100% is he, is he fit or is he 80% fit? So that would be a question mark. Um, but I don't expect much to change. I think England have, have made real strides forward. I think England will want to keep that continuity. And, and build from strength to strength. Yeah, there's a lot of tweets that came in sort of saying that maybe pitch curators are going to change things and maybe the pitch is going to look different. What kind of pitch do you want to see in Visakhapatnam? I think it's going to turn. It's not what I want to see. It's what's, what's going to happen there because it's a newly laid pitch. We saw what happened against New Zealand in the one-day game where it turned square and Amit Mishra got a fifer. So it's going to spin again. It was That was a one-day game and this is the five-day game. So I think the toss will be very, very crucial. If I was England, Maybe I would have, maybe, and I would ask Nick that question. Garrett Batty in place of uh, Zafar Ansari, the left-arm spinner, maybe, because he's a bit more accurate, puts the ball in the right areas on a turning pitch in Vizak. Maybe he needs someone to put the ball in the right areas. And secondly, about Jimmy Anderson, you know, as he said, as Nick said very rightly, he hasn't played much cricket. But then, how does England decide? Because England don't play any warm-up matches in between. So at any stage, if they want to get Jimmy Anderson in the squad. They'll have to take that chance of making him play straight away. But to be honest, I think uh, if, if Jimmy Anderson plays, I think he has to play in place of Stuart Broad because I don't see Chris Wokes or Ben Stokes being All replaced right. because they not only just bowl, right. they're quicker than Jimmy Anderson and they add right. a bit with Thank the batting you, down the uh, order. That's all the time we've got for. Thank you very much. Nick, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank we'll see more of you on the second test. So too of Saurav Ganguly. Keep tweeting to us. We'll see you on the first day, 10 p.m. Until then, it's goodbye.